Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. It's an honor to be presenting the third uh, mini lecture for the Islam and, tra and the Transatlantic Black Liberation uh, series hosted by a uh, program of African studies at Northwestern University. Uh, and with thanks to uh, PIS director, Chris Abani for sponsoring this um, talk, talk series. Um, so my paper is called um, Islam, Blackness and African Cultural Distinction, the Islamic Negritude of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias. So the Muslim community of the Senegalese Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, who died in 1975, uh, has tens of millions of uh, adherents, mostly in West Africa. It's one of the largest religious networks in the later 20th century, both on the African continent and in the Muslim world. But outside of the field of African Islam, the movement has received only passing mention in Islamic studies, and its engagement with the discourses of African decolonization is hardly appreciated in studies of African nationalism. This is despite Nias's more obvious invocation of seminal themes of decolonization uh, in authoring such anti-colonial treatises uh, as Africa for the Africans. Like many intellectuals interested in the liberation of African peoples from European colonialism, Shehraim was uh, also campaigned for African unity in the wake of decolonization. Such an aspiration inevitably raised an associated question that occupied the philosophers of negritude. Was there an, any inherent foundation for the unity of Africans or uh, specifically black Africans besides their shared history? Given the racialized nature of colonialism and anti-colonial resistance, it is not surprising that Shebrahim and his community articulated some perspective on African cultural or racial distinction. Ideas of African cultural uh, or racial distinction, most, no, no, most notably negritude, largely have been dismissed as marginal to ordinary Africans or the vast majority who did not have the opportunity to study in Paris or London and meet with ideologues of black nationalism from the diaspora. The idea of a shared Negro African culture with which Leopold Senghor defined as the quote, some total uh, some of the cultural values of the Black world seems mostly predicated on reversing the alienation experienced by Blacks confronting the racial prejudice experienced in Western societies. While the specifics of racial construction in the West, to which Western educated Africans responded, should not be taken as the norm among quote unquote ordinary Africans, it is also true that issues of race have not been altogether absent from Black Africans who had never been to Europe or America. Indeed, race is often invoked in Shea Rhyme's writing, and such pronouncements are not only directed at Arab co-religionists co as part of a centuries-old debate on racial prejudice in the Islamic world. In fact, whiteness is subtly repositioned in these writings as a marker of infidel Europeans, with Arabs and Black Africans closer to, to salvation based on their love for the Prophet Muhammad. However, the Sheikh's poetry, like other accounts of the Prophet's physical description, does contain the description of the, of the quote unquote whiteness of the Prophet's face. Quote, and from the pure whiteness of his face do, do the clouds provide water by him has the dark night of ignorance been illumined. End quote. But overall, this poetry differentiates between three basic racial types, black, brown, uh, or ahmar, uh, red uh, and white. Quote, by the prophet do the black, brown, and white obtain felicity, uh, says Shehraim in his poetry. Aside from the unique reference to the prophet's whiteness above, generally the category of white is positioned as, an, as the non-Muslim European other, while Muslims are brown and black. The sheikh wrote, may, may God accept their efforts and forgive them, the Muslims, both black and brown. In one speech in Egypt, Shehraim thus elided any, any distinction between Arabs and Africans within Islam, reminding Imam Abdel Nasser as the primary ideologue of Pan-Arabism that Arab nationalism was simply an ideology to confront colonialism and it applied to all who had, quote, answered the call of Muhammad and extended, quote, from Accra in Ghana to the farthest ends of the earth. But elsewhere, the Sheikh makes a stricter juxtaposition between black and white, where blackness is associated with piety and belief and whiteness is associated with corruption and infidelity or kufr. Quote, the black people in your presence, O prophet, are those strong voiced in praise. 
he continued. Black people have no hope unless in Muhammad Taha, the same for white people. Black Africa or Sudan has gained preeminence in love for our prophet and all white people have been humiliated in their hatred for him. Prejudiced white people thus delighted in the whiteness of their outward appearance, while their souls were dark in their rejection of the prophet's light. Quote, from him, uh, from love of him, have black people become pure and in hatred of him, meaning the prophet, have the, black, have the blameworthy among white people become darkened. It is thus clear that Shay Rhyme's Arabic poetry repositions existing categories in pre-modern Arabic literature of white, brown, and black to apply to a new historical circumstance where Arabs, Africans, and other non-whites are juxtaposed to European white people who pridefully reject the teachings of Islam. Thus, whiteness and blackness of the skin have no inherent merit for a Shayraim. Both are definitively sublimated to the purity or, or opacity of the human soul underneath the skin. The circumstances of independence, especially uh, in Senegal under one of Negritude's chief proponents, Leopold Senghor, ne necessitated the Sheikh's further elaboration on Black racial identity in a non Islamic context. Senghor believed that Black cultural unity root, rooted in an ontology of life forces vibrating throughout a subjective rather than rationally objectified universe was a more durable basis for African unity than anti-colonialism. It is unclear whether Negritude became an important ideology for, for, for ordinary Senegalese Muslims, but Senghor as president did attempt to insert his ideology into Senegalese society through patronizing African arts, education, and public buildings. Significantly for Muslims, this latter included mosques. Senghor was influential in releasing government funds for the construction of the mosque in Tuba and the Grand Mosque of Dakar. And given the threat of isolation from government resources, as well as from possible popular discourse on Black racial identity among Senegalese Muslims, at least in Dakar, figures such as Sheikh Rahim would have found it necessary to at least engage the topic of negritude or Black racial identity, whatever their personal distaste for preoccupation with racial distinction. There are several indications from the personal papers of Sheikh Rahim Nias that he did in fact enter that debate on negritude, but with the specific purpose of inserting Islam into the discourse. A 1973 letter from the director of Senegal's National Police School, Abdullah Sisi to Senghor, assured the president of the Sheikh's loyalty to the government and urged him to support the construction of the mosque in Medina Bay. Abdullah Sisi, a disciple of Sheikh Rahim, recommended the Sheikh to Senghor, quote, as a fervent and enlightened militant of negritude, and quote, a nationalist now politically determined to support the government's action and uphold the general political ideology of the general secretary, secretary meaning Senghor himself, of the Senegalese Progressive Union. That's the, that was Senghor's uh, party during the time. Of course, Sheikh Rahim's personal relationship with Senghor was such that it required these assurances. He voted for Lemin Gay against Senghor at independence, supported Tijan C's rival PSS party in 1959, and rejected Senghor's attempt to impose French family law codes on the Muslim populace with the 1970 Code de la Famille. Nonetheless, Shebraim engaged the debate on negritude directly in a letter to, to Senghor in 1962. The letter originally in French is, co is quoted here at length to capture the development of, of the Sheikh's argument. Well, I had the honor of receiving your handwritten letter of August 21st, 1962, and I'm thanking you because it allowed me to recall these words of a wise man. The soul of a people is as impenetrable for another people as is the soul of individuals. Nobody understands anybody else, but this is not a reason to not collaborate, to not love each other. Such an idea obligates us with a daily struggle that we must lead in service of bettering the human condition. We understand the struggle to concern the condition of humanity in general, and not a few men in particular. And we understand that this betterment is not produced by material elements, but by the fulfillment and blossoming of the human personae in all its forms. We know excellence that the destiny of this country depends on what we do for ourselves, uh, by ourselves. For it is possible, it is as possible for us as for other people on the earth to develop our own racial identity, deep racial. This 
uh, possibility is due to the resources that modern civilization offers to all and due to the abilities and rights that we have recovered from our historical past, from our culture, from our art, and from our political and social forms of life. We alone have the capacity to provide some African contributions to humanity. And in this common march towards a common destiny with other African states, we desire that our civilization bears the mark not only of our belief, but also the path we have taken to come to these beliefs. And this is a human path because humanity is not a standard mean or moyen, but is made of man's whole variety of experiences. God has given us a relevant instruction for individual and collective comportment in a civilized society. Uh, and Surah 103 of the Quran, Wal Asr, by the time. Uh, and I would hope that such teaching therein be a source of reconciliation between men uh, and a source of fraternal collaboration for a better future for Senegal in a free and united Africa. While waiting to see you again, Excellence, I pray you accept my sentiments of respect and dedication. So in this letter, the Sheikh thus suggested that the struggle toward bettering the human condition required mutual cooperation while maintaining respect for individual and community differences. But in this embrace of Black African cultural difference, the Sheikh did not exactly contradict um, his rejection of racial differentiation. He linked cultural identity to historical, social, and political and artistic factors rather than an innate racial essence. In this regard, the Sheikh was probably more in line with Amy Césaire's version of negritude than Senghor's. Césaire, of course, may, remained unimpressed by attempts epitom epitomized by Father Temple's Bantu philosophy to locate the quote-unquote African soul and argued that the cultural, the cultural continuities of the African civilization, which were nonetheless essential for the African Renaissance, were the result of historical and other environmental factors. Césaire, however, mostly located the shared historical experience of Black people in suffering. For Sheikh, for, for Sheikh, for Sheikh Ibrahim, African cultural distinction was constructed out of both history and the contemporary political movement moment. Nonetheless, the shared experiences of oppression uh, were, only, uh, were only one development in the long history of African societies. For Sheikh Ibrahim, the successes of African culture, of which Muslims were primary formulators, could be the source for a distinctive African contribution to the world, providing, quote, humanity with some African contributions, which we alone are capable. Sheikh Ibrahim might thus be said to represent a third way of thinking of negritude, sharing the historical emphasis of Césaire, of Césaire and Senghor's accent on the internal vibrancy of a distinctive Africanity. But we should not be too quick to demarcate uh, this quote unquote Islamic negritude from <clears throat> that of uh, Western educated elites such as Senghor. The acquisition of Islamic knowledge as practiced in the community of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias and of other scholarly communities in West Africa can best be conceptualized as a form of human becoming. Like the jazz musician who internalizes the pattern notes of past masters in order to improvise new artistic forms, the Muslim scholar comes to actualize or embody Islamic knowledge in his very presence, representing a dynamic reproduction of religious subjectivity in each new interaction with his audience and environment. For Shaybrahim and his community, the very being of the African Muslim scholar was no doubt the ultimate art form that personified the genius of the African soul. Furthermore, Senghor's deep fascination with rhythm, the juxtaposition of sound and silence, resonates with Nias's concept of the Gnostic scholar as the embodiment of divine remembrance. Consider, for example, how Senghor's conception of rhythm and the creation of a Black aesthetic or Bantu philosophy described below by uh, Suleiman Bashir Jang might actually express the aspiration of the Muslim scholar provided the life force mentioned here is the one God and the art form is the being of the scholar himself. 
Suleiman Bashir Jang describes this black aesthetic as Sangorian aesthetics makes force above all a rhythm. The ontology of forces here becomes more precisely one of rhythm. And artistic creation is the art of combining rhythms or rhythmic series. For Sangor at root, if aesthetics verify and confirm Bantu philosophy, it is because the latter is in itself in aesthetics. And accordingly, we can add the following corollaries to its constitutive theses. <clears throat> One, what defines the individuality of a force is its rhythm. Two, one opens up to the object of a by a rhythmic attitude that comes into phase with it. And this attitude is constitutive of aesthetic emotion. And three, a forced rhythm <clears throat> in the work of art harmoniously arranges the different rhythms that constitute it and combines them into an organic whole. Sheikh Ibrahim's understanding of the Sufi remembrance of God leading to God's possession of the human being, the vital force that seizes us at the root of, root of being, as Senghor might put it, uh, presents an interesting corollary, corollary to Senghor's thought. Shehraim writes, the quickest way to enter the divine presence is through the remembrance, because the name is inseparable from the one named. As the one engaged in remembrance ceaselessly mentions the name of God, the veils are torn to shreds bit by bit until the heart comes to witness God directly. The heart becomes in the presence of the remembrance empty of the entirety of existence so that nothing remains in it other than God. Mighty is his remembrance. The heart has thus become the abode of the manifest truth and God is his tongue with which he speaks. If the one possessing such a heart were to strike a blow, God becomes his hand with which he strikes. And if he, and if he hears, God is his ear with which he hears. The most high who is remembered has taken possession of the heart, so he controls it. He has taken possession of the limbs of the body, so he uses them for what is pleasing to him. He has taken possession of the servant's character traits, so he operates them however he wills for the sake of his pleasure. In other words, the disposition acquired by the true scholar or Gnostic of God is one that transcends the subject-object divide, one which allows the artist to experience what Senghor would call, quote, the lived identity of knowledge and the known, the lived in the thought, the lived in the real, end quote. The being of the scholar artist thus becomes the vehicle for the active creation of the transcendent divine being, as Sherein would express in poetry, quote, my will is the will of the real and the servant is as the pen. Thank you very much.